like so to say <clears throat> I had um, a message as of, as of last week already prepared and last night the Holy Spirit stopped me oh that would help anyway the Holy Spirit stopped me and told me to give another message and it usually doesn't happen like that unless something's up or something's wrong um, going through can you do something with her please the belt's right there behind you what? the belt's right there behind you anyway um, going through some of the conversations and statements I've made to me on Facebook among other places <clears throat> people really don't bother to go back and study the word and check it out and instead of hearing a message going and checking it out studying it to make sure that what they're being taught is right they just run with it and the more they run with it the more they believe what they're being taught and I'm going to show you that is completely heretical it's completely against the word and it's a form of laziness and the word condemns it um, <clears throat> Exodus 8 verse 20 and Hadiah said unto Moses rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh lo he cometh forth to the water and say unto him Thus saith Halia, let my people go that they may serve me. If you've got a highlighter, I want you to highlight that. Let my people go that they may serve me. Most people have no clue, have no idea, that in order for you to serve Halia or Yahweh, you have to get out from under Pharaoh. There is no other option. Yahshua said you cannot serve two masters. Okay? And anything other than Yahweh that you hold up or or Haya that you hold up as a deity, for an example, most of Americans today hold up money as a deity. Without realizing it, they hold up even an image of a person they've never met have no clue about they hold that up as an image of a deity and I'm speaking of the picture of Jesus mm. they have never met him have no clue who he even is yet they hold him up as being a god and he is nothing of the sort the person in the image is not Yahshua the son of God nor the son of Yahweh it is Lucifer himself I'll show you that in Ezekiel 28 alright and watch this well, before we do that, I want you to go to Isaiah 53. We had a message a couple weeks on this about the image. And most people are clueless, flat out, absolutely ignorant when it comes to the image of who the person Jesus actually is. First of all, how many know the name Jesus did not even appear until 480? Mm -hmm. How many know the picture itself didn't even appear until the late 1500s? Okay. That was actually a rendition of an artist. The guy never met him, have no clue who he even is. He just took a picture of a, of a beautiful person and drew it out and now all people in every home have it just about watch this verse 2 he should grow up before him as a tender plant as a root out of a dry ground this is Isaiah prophesying of Yahshua he hath no form nor comeliness and the word comeliness means attractiveness <clears throat> verse 2 when we shall see him there is no beauty highlight that there is no beauty, nothing beautiful about him, that we would desire him. 
Okay, now, Ezekiel 28. Verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, or the king of tyranny, and say unto him, Thus saith Hoya, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Okay? Keyword, sealest up the sum. What does that mean? No. That means he is sealing up wisdom. So man cannot have it. Watch this. Full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of high. Every precious stone was thy covering. And I want you to watch this because what was the high priest commanded to do? In the Old Testament. He was commanded to wear the twelve stones upon his chest. Watch this. Every precious stone was I covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, and gold. Everything that was on his chest, well, the high priest's chest, guess who wore it first? Lucifer did. Don't you think for one moment that he knows the word more than you do? He knew it better than Aaron did. Hello? Lucifer was a high priest in the beginning. Now watch this. <clears throat> the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of Hoya. Thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Why is it that when fire, or I should say when, when a person looks upon fire, the almost instant reaction is fear? This is judgment, doesn't it? Hmm? Does it represent judgment? Mm -mm. Because it can do such damage. Mm -mm. It because Satan's in it. Mm -hmm. I believe that. Mm -hmm. Hello. Satan is in the fire. The word just said so. He walks up and down in the stones of fire. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. That means that's the reason why most people, when, when you speak of baptism of fire, they want nothing to do with it. They turn around, and, uh, turn around and run in the opposite direction. Why? Because they're afraid of messing with him. <coughs> Do you know he is the last enemy to be overcome? Mm -hmm. You know the word says that fire is a purging. What's it purging? Satan, it's getting Satan out of your life. That's what it's for. That's why you have to go through the fire. All right, now watch this. Back to Exodus. <clears throat> what did I say, eight? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Thus saith Hoya, let my people go that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, upon thy servants, upon thy people, and into thy houses. The house of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, also the ground whereon they are. I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end that thou mayest know that I am Hoya in the midst of the earth. I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. I want you to highlight that. I will put a division between my people and thy people. How many know that the Pharaoh started in Samuel? 
In Samuel the person? No, in First Samuel. Oh. When they said, let a king be put over us, yes. mm -hmm. that's when all the pharaohs started coming in. Okay? Egypt was only a, sim a symbolic... Uh, what's the word? Demonstration? Mm, it, was, it was a symbolic representation of what was getting ready to come on. You notice every nation now has an emperor, a king, a president, a governor, whatever, whatever you want to call them. They have a Caesar figure. Okay, watch this. <clears throat> Go to 33, Exodus 33. Probably asleep. Oh, that was hot. Over there. Verse 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated. So what does his presence do? It separates. What is the word grace? If you want to get technical about it, what is the word grace? Wait a minute. Churches have twisted this into being unmerited favor. When it means absolutely nothing about it. Do you know what grace literally is? Mm -hmm. What? No. Nope. That's the definition of the word. But what is it? That's the definition of the word. What is it? Grace is a separation from all people. It is literally a marismos. When grace has appeared to your life, you are separate from all people of the earth. Moses just defined it right here. Watch this again. Wherein shall it be known? Highlight it. Known. Wherein shall it be known? In other words, how are we going to identify what grace is? How is it going to be known what grace is? Watch. That I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated. I and thy people from all the people. All the people. Did he say all of Israel shall be separated from all the earth? What did he say? What did he say? I and your people. Whoever is his. Whoever belongs to him. It's not specifically Israel. And when I say specifically Israel, I'm speaking of the physical Israel. I'm not speaking of spiritual Israel. There are those that are circumcised in the flesh and those circumcised in the heart. There's a difference. As Paul said, they're not all Israel, which are from Israel. Now, pay attention to this. I and thy people shall be separate from all people of the earth. Okay? Now, watch this. Exodus 14. The word Egypt, and if you've got a pen, write this down because this is this is key. <clears throat> the word Egypt is Mitrium in Hebrew, M I T S R A Y I M, and it means between two straits. Okay. 
Jane probably already wrote this down already. Between two straights. The word straight means a hard place or a dilemma. So if you're in Egypt, it means you are literally in the middle of two hard places or two dilemmas. Okay? What does that mean? It means that you are stuck between, we literally get the English phrase between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. We're between two hard places, okay? It is hard to serve Hoya. And that, that ain't no lie. Any of his prophets will tell you that. Ask, Go ask Isaiah, who had to walk for three years naked in, in Israel. Or ask Jonah, who had to do something completely against his will. Or Yahshua, had to, who had to fight against his own will to resist on the blood. As we are supposed to. All right. Now think about this a minute. That is a hard place. And then you've got a harder place where you have to serve in bondage. Which one would you choose? It doesn't matter. They're both hard places. Which one do you choose? But who told you it was highest way? Because it was the hardest. Just got done telling you they're both hard places. So which one do you choose? Which one do you know is the right chip, the right choice? The hardest of the two. You said they're both hard, but there's got to be one harder than the other. Whichever one follows his law. How would you know his law if you've never been told it? Well, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Your conscience would. Not if you don't have it. Mm. I'm trying to key you into discernment. Mm. How would you know? You wouldn't. You'd probably end up in the same shoes as Israel. Give us meat to eat. We're tired of the bread. We're tired of the milk. How many times have I heard, oh, I'm tired of going over the old stuff. We want something new. We want deeper, deeper learning. We want deeper knowledge. I've said it. Watch. Exodus 14. Verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Think about that a minute. It's better to serve the Egyptians and die under their hand than to die alone out in the wilderness. Who told them they were going to die in the wilderness? Because Haya told them they wouldn't. Watch this. And Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still. Did you see the word stand still? Mm -hmm. The word also means to stand firm. And see the salvation of Haya. Which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see him again no more. How many? How much? Forever. Okay. So what was the point? What was the point of taking him out in the wilderness? Because as long as you're in the wilderness, you're not being distracted by all the other junkets. Wait a minute. What was the point of taking them out in the wilderness? So that they would never again fit in with the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. We just got done reading what the definition of grace was. A known separation. Huh? 
Hello. So what was the point of taking them out in the wilderness? What sets us apart from all people of the earth? I know you're going to say grace. But there's more to it than that. His law. That was where he gave us his law. All the churches. And let me explain this because this is a key point. All the churches are still in Egypt. They've never come out. The church people, the so-called professed Christians, have never come out of Egypt, ever. You know what the two anointed ones are for? Two Moses figures. Bringing them out of Egypt. I can show you that in chapters 11 and 12. Chapters 11 and 12, it shows you an Elijah figure and a Yahshua figure showing up. One takes them in the wilderness, the other one takes them deeper into the wilderness. No wonder they're going to hate him. They That's exactly it. Zone. Watch this. <clears throat> Judges 2. Let me ask you something. How is it? The word says we are not supposed to adopt the ways of the pagans, the heathen. We're not supposed to do... Well, let's go there and look. Jeremiah 10. Hold your hand there. Verse 1, Hear ye the word which Haya speaketh unto you. Who? Who? Haya. What is the house of Israel? It's the temple. So he's talking directly to the temple. He's saying, look, hear my word tabernacle or the temple are we temples yes. so this is directly to us yes. right mm -hmm. watch thus saith Haya learn not the way of the heathen period we're not to learn the ways of the heathen and one of the guys at work asked me just the other day I said you know, would you guys get any candy for your kids on Halloween? I said, we don't celebrate Halloween. What? What about Christmas? I said, I don't celebrate Christmas. I'm not to learn the way of the pagans. Oh, but all the kids have to have Christmas. Your mom and dad raised you up in, in Halloween and Christmas. I said, no, they didn't. Oh, you're full of crap. He's like, I know your mom and dad for 13 years. Yes, they did. I said, no, they didn't. I said, you don't know my parents very well then if that's the case. We don't celebrate it. And I said, I'm not going to raise my kids up in it either. Why lie to them about Easter Bunny and, and Santa Claus when they don't exist? That's just teach them it's okay to lie. Mm -hmm. Watch. Learn not the way of the heathen. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. You know what the word dismayed is? Let me show you. This is hilarious. It's Chathath. Or Kathath, whatever you want. It means to prostrate or to break down. To be amazed or terrified. Another one. This is the one that's really important. Confused. In other words, to follow the stars, to follow the signs of heaven, is nothing but confusion. Mm -hmm. Alright, now watch this. The heathen are dismayed or confused at them. For the customs of the people are what? Mm -hmm. 
What's another word for vain? That's another one. Useless. Empty. Empty. In other words, there's no profit in it. There's nothing for your good in it. It won't teach you to grow. It's not for edification. Paul said everything that we do, we're supposed to do for edification. Well, what's following the ways of the heathen? It's not for edification. It won't build you up. What's it do? It makes you empty. It makes you vain. Now watch. Skip on down to uh, verse 6. For as much as there is none like unto thee, Ohio, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. How is it that the belief structure or the belief system of the church today, the Jesus, the God, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, how is it that it is a doctrine followed by every religion on the face of the planet? Every one of them have a deity figure that's, that is a trinity. Think about it. It's funny that the name Jesus comes from the name Isis. And one guy brought it up to me. He goes, well, how, how is that when Isis was a female goddess of, of Egypt? He said, all you got to do is switch the, the male and female around. It's no different. And if you go back and look up the Greek word autos, it means a male or female. Hello. So it could be utilized for either one. It's also funny that Isis was considered the healer. And yet, they call Jesus the great physician. Hello? It's a replica. Does that mean we can't follow the great? No. That means you need to be watching what you read in it. Take it back to the Hebrew because there, just about every Greek word has a Hebrew equivalent. Just like when you look, and this is the funny part, if it doesn't have a Hebrew equivalent, that means it didn't come from the Hebrew. Go look it up. Most of the Greek words that you find that actually came from the Hebrew will say, see Hebrew such and such number, or from the Hebrew number, blah, 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 blah. Sabaton is another one where it comes from the word Sabbath. Sabaton means the Hebrew 7676, the Hebrew Sabbath. If it doesn't, then that means it's an added word. Hello? And it's awful funny, Jesus is an added word. It doesn't come from the Hebrew. So it's basically a universal line. That's, a, that's all it is. It's a universal tradition taught by the Catholic Church. That's what the word Catholic means, universal. It means it'll fit in any religion. But this was reminded of something last night at commercial came on. It was a song with a bunch of teenagers dancing mm -hmm. around. And the song, the words, because I was not watching it, but I heard it. Mm -hmm. The words were try and get rid of the six six six. That was in the song. Yep. Now watch. Verse 7, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the Gentiles, in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. Highlight it. In all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. In other words, there's not in any one of these doctrines, in any one of these religions, has anyone like Yahweh. Not one of them. They cannot figure out how, and I explained this to a Trinity believer the other day. I said, how is it that Joshua himself says, I ascend up to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Of course, I'm quoting from the Greek, or the English. I said, and yet you guys all profess that he's God when he said he ascends up to his God and our God. Oh, well, he's just a, a one part of the Trinity. How's that? Well, because he said, you know, I and my father are one. I said, the word also says that he prayed to his father, saying, let us also be one as we are one. I said, does that make us part of the Trinity also? <laughs> they don't bother to read that. They don't bother to check it out. It's the same Greek word. 
Now watch this. There is none, there is none like unto thee. In any of those religions, there's none. None of them. Like unto Yahweh. What does that tell you? It means he's not in those other religions. Mm -hmm. They don't worship the same deity. That's what Jeremiah is explaining. Watch. They are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. In other words, you want to go back to the stock, back to the basic of every religion. It's vanity. It's all about pride. Now watch. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish. Gold from Euphaz, the work of the workmen, of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. And he's explaining the doctrine of Tarshish, which is out of Babylon. Okay? Now watch. But Haya is the true Almighty. He is the living Almighty. And an everlasting king, at his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the Gentiles shall not be able to abide his indignation. I just explained to you last week that Ephraim's seed is the fullness of the Gentiles, right? Now watch, because this is who he's talking to. Or I should say talking about. Thus shall you say unto them, The gods have not made the heavens and the earth. Your idols have not made the heavens and the earth. Even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. And a guy just I was telling me the other day, and this it really irritated me, but I just let him ramble off. He was telling me, oh, well, you know, the God of the Buddhists and the God of, uh, of Israel and the God of the Gentiles and the God of Iran and the God of Islam, they're all the same deity. I said, no, they're not. Not once. I said, you look at the book of, of, the, of the, the correct Hebrew, not the, the English version of the Hebrew, but read the Hebrew book. They, don't, they do not line up with any other book in any other religion. Supposedly, the book of Islam, or the Quran, is supposed to be Ishmael's version of the story of Abraham and Isaac. Doesn't even agree. The English version does not even agree. And I explained this to a guy yesterday, or last night as a matter of fact. If you take the English text and you actually go back to the Hebrew text and read it, they don't compare. How is it that this is supposed to be a, a translation from one language to the next, yet they don't even agree? How is it? Can't be. It's because it's been interpreted, not translated. Hello? Anybody who sits down to translate, they throw in their own opinion of what the text says instead of saying, wait a minute, let's translate it word for word as it's written. Watch. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. He causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. I want you to highlight that part. His voice is the multitude of waters. Read in John, I believe it's chapter 1 and 2. Who was John seeing? Was it the testimony of Joshua or was it the testimony of the Father? It was the Father who was speaking to him in the likeness of the Son. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. It simply means if I am fully 100% obedient to him, every word I speak is my father speaking through me. That's all. How hard is that to comprehend? Is it? If you're speaking his word, 
Who's speaking? It's not, it's not your words, it's your voice. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is putting in a, a, an audible to it. It's still his word. Mm -hmm. and watch. Where am I? Just Thank you. 14. Every man is British in his knowledge. Every founder... Do you know 99% of all the denominations, well I shouldn't say that, I should say 100% of all denominations today have a founder, and it is not Yahshua. They're a man. Who do you think Jeremiah is condemning here? Watch. Every founder is confused by the graven image. It is. Look at every church today. I don't care what church you go into. I don't care if it's a satanic church. What's on it? What? The cross. Even the satanic churches have the upside down cross. It's a graven image. He was never hung on a cross. Hello? Watch this. His molten image is falsehood. There is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. Did you hear me? There is a difference in Gentiles and heathen. Did you know that? You should. Because most of the people in the church today are heathen, not Gentiles. The Gentiles, and this is how you know the difference. The Gentiles have accepted the fact that they have been adopted into Jacob. You talk to a heathen today, they swear up and down, they will, they will profess and lie to your face to try to say they have nothing to do with Israel. Israel has been cut off, they want nothing to do with Israel, Israel has been shut down, they're going to go through hell, they're going to go through tribulation, and they alone, the heathen, are going to be raptured out. Watch this. The portion of Jacob is not like them. He is the former. What? He is what? The former of all things. What does that mean? He is the former of Israel. Everybody, in, and you cannot explain this to anybody. Well, I shouldn't say that. You can't explain this to any heathen. You have to be adopted into Jacob before you can become Israel. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And most people don't even understand what Paul wrote. What do you think the adoption was all about? It was adopting you into Jacob so you could grow up into Israel. The law is the schoolmaster under Jacob, not under the Gentiles, not under the heathen. They have no law. Is everybody following me? Go back and read again. Paul said it. A Gentile, there is no law. But once they are adopted into Jacob, they now sit under the schoolmaster until they get that faith. Okay? Now watch. Israel is the rod of his inheritance. Yahweh of hosts is his name. That is the rod. Does anybody know that? Yahweh is the rod.
He gave us his name as our inheritance. Now watch this. Back to Judges 2. Verse 18. Ah, let me back that up. Verse 15. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of Yahweh was against them for evil. As Hawaii had said, and as Hawaii had sworn unto them, they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, Yahweh raised up judges which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. They would, sorry, yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other deities. This is what Paul was talking about. Their circumcision became uncircumcision. And bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of Hiah, but they did not. When Yahweh raised up judges, then Yahweh was with the, with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. It repented Yahweh because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. It came to pass when the judge was dead. I like this. When? When the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers. When you remove the righteous judges, what does a judge do? Enforces the law. Hello? He enforces the law. Your judges are your evangelists, pastors, teachers. When you replace them with wolves, hear me out. When you replace them with wolves, the log goes down the drain. And you will end up going on a whoring. Just ask Dalton. Watch this. In following other deities to serve them, to bow down unto them, they cease not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn ways. What was the purpose of the law? From doing our own ways to get us out of stubbornness, right? Well, read again. From doing, from ceasing from your own doings, from walking after your own stubborn way. That's what the law is for. And the anger of Yahweh was hot against Israel, and he said, Because that this people hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, because they have not hearkened, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the Gentiles which Joshua left when he died. Would you just read? I'm not going to drive out the Gentiles from before your face anymore. Why? Because of the stubbornness. That through them I may prove Israel, or test Israel, whether they will keep the way of Yahweh to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. So why did he leave a few Gentiles in among us? Test. To see whether we were going to walk in his ways or not. 
Why did he put the thorns and the thistles, the thorns and the briars, in amongst the wheat? To see whether we were going to keep his ways or if we were going to follow the thorns and the thistles. They were following it. Watch this. Therefore, Yahweh left those Gentiles without driving them out hastily, neither delivered or saved he them into the hand of Joshua. Do you think that's prophetic? Because Joshua is Joshua. Hello? Let me read that again. Therefore Yahweh left those Gentiles. He left the Catholic Church. Without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he the or he them into the hand of Joshua. Why not? Because it was to test his true Israel, to see that we, whether they were going to go back and check out the original text, or accept the way it was written. Is everybody hearing me? Watch this. That's, kind of what we're doing now. that's exactly what we're doing now. Matthew 9. Verse 35, And Yahshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, or the millions. Now put this in today's church. When he saw the millions, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted. What's another word for fainting? Under Falling him. away. Yeah. Falling away. And were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. As sheep, having no shepherd. Now watch this. Then saith he and his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. I want you to highlight that. The laborers are few. There are very few that are willing to labor. That's literally what it means. Very few are willing to labor. I was just talking to a guy, matter of fact, this morning. And he's trying to tell me, oh, well... Yashro did away with the law in himself. That's what he nailed to the cross. I said, no, he didn't. I said, do you even bother to go back and check out the actual wording in the Greek and actually listen to what the word says? Or are you just running on the commentaries? Because it's nothing for me to, to write down a commentary and say, oh, well, I think the whole, the whole of this chapter is such and such. You cannot get an entire whole of a chapter by looking at the main scripture or the first scripture and the last scripture. It won't give you a, a dialogue or it won't give you what's the meaning of the scripture. You've got to study out the, the scripture. Find out what it is saying. Labor to find it. Watch. Pray you therefore, the master of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What is his harvest? Mm -hmm. 
shooting. You know, I thought that for a long time. That's not its harvest. Sense. What's been missing for two thousand years? Sun. What's been missing for two thousand years? Ooh. How are you gonna get a sun when you've got corrupt versions? The truth is it's the truth. It's the word. The word is missing. His harvest is the word. It's been corrupted. It's our job to labor, to go forth and find the fruits that he wanted us to follow. Is everybody following? It's kind of like if Jane tells me, let's say, um, <sighs> brain fart. Yeah. Um. Any, well, anybody. Let's say mom. Mom tells Jane something. Jane comes and tells me something. I'm hearing a second-hand account. Okay? And what she's telling me is not going to be what mom told me originally, or what mom had originally. Because with that, it's the Chinese phone game. Yes. Okay? Yes. Perfect point. Yeah. While mom may have said this, she may have understood it this way, or she may have heard it differently. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. But when you give it to me, now it's intertwined with what you heard or your opinion of what you think. 99% mm -hmm. of a person's story comes with what they think it means. And even one word changes it. Now, what do you think the English translation is? The exact same thing. It's an interpretation of what he thinks the scriptures were saying when he writes down the translation. So it's a third hand account. Mm -hmm. So they didn't translate, they interpreted. They interpreted. Okay? Because I can show you multiple scriptures in the original Hebrew that there are numerous amounts of English words added that don't even exist in the Hebrew. Why? Oh, well, J King James wanted a poetic version. No. It's not either. It's because they wanted to add what their opinion of the text was. What they thought it should have said. Instead of what it really said. How many here know, knows what the shortest verse in the Bible is? That's what you were told, isn't it? Yeah. You know it's not? It's not. Nope. Praise y'all. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. They don't bother to tell you that. What's the difference between Jesus wept and praise y'all? Because we're, y'all should be getting the praise. And Jesus Bingo. Is a fake. Bingo. Oh, wow, that's the wrong word. Yeah. Now watch this. <clears throat> pray or uh, pray, therefore, the master of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. What is his harvest? His I just word. got done saying it. It's his word. How do we know that? Would he send you in among the Gentiles? No, if you don't have the word. No. What if he sent you in with the word? Think think about this a minute. Think long and hard because we just read it. He said he wouldn't scatter the Gentiles from our presence. Okay, wait a minute. You're missing the point. If he's not going to scatter the Gentiles from our presence, then what's that mean? We don't have to run on us. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Do we have to labor with the Gentiles that are with us? Or are they never going to change from a Gentile? They're never going to change. Fullness of the Gentiles. Ephraim's seed would be the fullness of the Gentiles. Be following. Go back and read in the prophets. Does Ephraim ever, ever come out of their Gentile statehood? No. They're condemned in it. 
It says, Well, into the house of Ephraim. <coughs> now watch. Isn't Jacob a Gentile? Depends on how you want to look at Gentile. He said all oh, Jacob. But is what is Jacob? Jacob is uncircumcised. But he still will be to the law. Really? really? Mm -hmm. Like Jacob is his called, Israel is his chosen. Okay. Now watch. Oh. Revelation 2 17. So are you saying Ephraim is so full of Gentiles they'll never come off? Nope. Ephraim will never be saved. They are Gentiles. And will remain them. Yep. And if you understand fully who Ephraim is, you'll understand America will never change. That's right. Huh. Isn't it just America, the great Satan? Have you'll seen? see. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 17. He that hath, well, let me back that up. Verse 14. I have a few things against thee, because thou wast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. By the way, in case anybody didn't notice, that was a redneck saying. Right there. Thou hast there them. Just like there ain't no whatever. Watch. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed on the idols and to commit fornication. Now, wait a minute. Let me read that again. Balak taught to cast a stumbling block. Before whom? What is the stumbling block? So let me get this straight. Balak taught Messiah as our stumbling block. If that wouldn't be a heretical doctor, there would be nothing more. What was the heretical doctor that Balak taught? Prophet. P R O F I T. Watch. To cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto gods, idols, serpents, devils. All the same word. And to commit fornication. For fornication against who? Well, obviously it's against Yahweh. But with whom? all the other religions let's just go ahead and adopt this idea we'll get more people into the church let's go ahead and have let's say like a haunted house in the church yeah. and we'll get people in here on next Sunday he just adopted the pagan rituals yeah. oh let's go ahead and have a week of increase instead of Passover or Pentecost yeah. And we'll get more people in here. Is everybody following that? Yeah, yeah. What are what is the main goal behind that? Profit. Profit. Yeah. Fill up the seats. Is everybody following? Yeah. Now watch. Yeah. So hast thou also then that hold the doctor of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Which verse? Verse sixteen. Nope. Sorry. Fifteen. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? I told you this once before. Um, Preaching against the law. Hello? And what did he just say about it? That is the thing he hates. Preaching against the law. Paul never did. 
There are so many people I've heard, oh, well, Paul said the law is done away with, and we're, you know, he, Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles, so we're only supposed to listen to Paul. What? Paul is not the Messiah. Paul even said those that call themselves, you know, after Paul or Apollos or followers of Paul or Apollos, they're in the carnal. They don't deserve the spiritual fruits or the spiritual meat. <laughs> We're not of Paul. We're not of Dad. We're, you're not of me. Who are you of? Christ. Messiah. Should be of Yahweh. Hello? You're of the household of Israel. Now watch. Repent. Of what? Ever believing that the law was done away with, repent. Let me read this again. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, repent. Turn away from it. What? Is this not chapter 17? 16. Chapter 2. No, <laughs> Chinese phone all over the <laughs> Well, it's not getting over this side of the day. Verse 16, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, or speedily, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, the truth of my word is going to come against you. Not your translated versions. Mm, the real thing. I just was talking to a girl on Facebook um, the other day while I was at work who was trying to tell me all the law has been done away with. There's not a single scripture in the Bible that says it. Not one. There's never an a, a idea put forth in the Bible that there was ever an idea that the law has been done away with. Paul said that the law and commandments that was in what? ordinances was nailed to the tree which was the division between Gentile and Jew how do you rightly divide the word how would you rightly figure out what he's trying to say there I could show you about seven different scripture verses where it talks about where Jew cannot eat with a Gentile no other scripture verse That's the only thing that was abolished in the tree, was the fact that we could not share the word, eat the word, with the Gentile. Hmm. Do my phone. Hmm. We were not supposed to eat the holy thing with the uncircumcised. Do hmm. my phone. Mm -hmm. It means if you're still uncircumcised, I can't eat with you. But, that was abolished in the tree. Now, I can show you what the word means and what it says. Why? Because he wants all people adopted in the house of Israel. Go by following. Mm -hmm. Now watch. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the assemblies. To him that overcometh, overcome what? You know, I always thought it was death. You know what it is? It's laziness. Yeah. Refusing to labor. Laziness. Watch this. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Watch this, because this this is the key. Proverbs twenty one. It is not, nor ever has been, a labor to disobey. Did you know that? It has never been a work to disobey. You don't have to work at being disobedient. It's natural to you. 
how does everybody, I mean, how do you know that it's natural to you? That's the first thing they do. But how do you know? How do you know your parents weren't disobedient and they were just trying to correct you and follow you in their, their ways? Because it lined up with the Lord. How so? With the English version or with the original? Oh, 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 oh. Thou shalt oh. Are you following what I'm saying? So how do you know you were naturally disobedient? Because that was the easiest thing to do. In Romans 2, Paul said that death passed another <coughs> man because of Adam. He wasn't naturally disobedient. After he partook of the fruit, then he became naturally disobedient. And that passed on all men, naturally. Okay, and that's where where Yahshua or Yahweh said that he, the sin of the fathers would pass down to the third and fourth generation. Mm -hmm. Laziness. Yes. Hello. Watch this, because I'll show you something. The third and fourth generation of an alcoholic is always an alcoholic. After the fourth generation, that that generation actually overcomes alcoholism. Mm. Every time? Every time. It's been proven. The same thing with cancer. If cancer runs in the family, it'll, it'll only go down the third and fourth generation. After that, there's no more cancer in the family. Because they overcame it. Because they overcame it. Well, it's because it only passed down three and four generations. Until the fifth generation sins again. So it's just the fourth generation that's clean. Down to the fourth generation. Well, the fourth generation will be under the, the curse. The fifth generation will not. Hmm. Let me show you. But those other generations don't stay, have to stay under the curse. Let me show you. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Exodus 20. Real quick. 20. Exodus 20. Verse 5, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, Yahweh, thy al Almighty, am a jealous Almighty, visiting the lawlessness of the fathers, mm -hmm. visiting the lawlessness of the fathers, upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now watch. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. Let me read that again. Verse 6. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. So what is mercy for? Those that love me. What is grace for? What is grace for? The churches have it twisted. The churches think, oh, well, it's just because I love him, I'm under his grace. That's not what he said. You're only under mercy because you love him. Grace, he knows you. Under mercy, he doesn't know who you are. Is everybody following that? And it cracks me up how many churches preach, oh, he loves me unconditionally. No, he doesn't. His love is conditional. I don't care who you are, what you are, Every person on the face of the planet, their love is conditional. Where did we get that trait from? If you're nice to me, I'll love you until I'm blue in the face. If you if you be my friend, I'll love you till you're blue in the face. Wait a minute. I'm going somewhere with this. And you're going in the wrong direction. We got that from him. If you obey me, I will love you. If you don't, you're not my son. Is everybody following? Paul said it in Hebrews 12. Good are you bastards and not sons. He it means he cuts you off. If you don't obey and keep his commandments, he cuts you off. He doesn't know you. Okay, you won't get the Holy Ghost. Which is who? 
No, no, don't get into the Trinity doctrine. It's himself. Okay. No, nope. the Holy Ghost and the Father are the same person. He literally gives himself to you. It's the same thing, and let me explain it this way. It's the same thing as a man when he, when he marries a woman. He literally enters his wife. In a literal sense. Mm -hmm. And in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. Same way. You become one flesh. Alright, now watch. <coughs> Proverbs 21. Oops. There. Mm -hmm. 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him. Another word for desire is lust. The lust of the lazy will kill him. His hands refuse to labor. Oh, all you got to do is step into church, accept Jesus Christ, your master and savior, and all you got to do is read a scripture verse a day. You're done. You're in the kingdom. Welcome, brother, sister. Doesn't work that way. Put your foot in the seat, put your money in the plate. Let me read that again. The slothful refuse to labor. They refuse to search out and work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. The key word is work out. Labor. And if you go back in the Greek and read it and look it up, it means labor for your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, watch. One more, I believe. Well, actually, before I get there, the word slothful is remaya in the Hebrew. It means remissness. Remissness, remissness, whatever. R-E-M, whatever. R-E-M-I-S-S-N-E-S-S. Treachery. What are you reading? The Hebrew word for slothful. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Ramiah. R A M I Y A H. Okay. And I'll tell you something here in just a minute because it's a combination of two words. Mm -hmm. Treachery. Mm -hmm. Deceitful. False. Guile. Idle. Ideally. Or slack. Now, Ramaya is two words combined. Rami, which means against, and Yah. Hello. So if you are slothful, you will literally stand or oppose y'all. Hello. A person that is slothful will be full of guile, deceit, false ways, slack in all that he or she does. And the word slack, I'll explain to you in just a minute. The Greek word is nothros. N O T H R O S. It means sluggish, lazy, stupid. Don't smirk. Because there's another one. And it means dull. D U L L. Dull of hearing. Not only are they full of false ways, guile, laziness, they're dull of hearing, stupid, ignorant, in darkness, same word, but they're also sluggish. They're slow to act, slow to operate. Everyone here is guilty of it. 
including myself. You're told to do something? Yeah, I'll, I'll get that in a couple minutes. You're sluggish. We should be that quick to respond. That quick to act. No matter what it is. If the word says, look, labor, then labor. Don't even hesitate. The word says it, do it. Or if somebody asks you to do something, do it. ASAP. Get on it. Don't slack. Because that is sluggish. Watch this. Proverbs 26. Sixteen. Well, let me read verse fifteen. Well, actually, verse ten. The great Almighty that formed all things both rewardeth the fool and the transgressors. Or the lawbreakers. That's what a transgressor is. Now, wait a minute. Does it say that he also rewards the fools mm -hmm. and the, the lawbreakers? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me get this straight. The churches have believed that all that they're doing, even though they're in the wrong, all that they're doing, oh, they're being blessed by God in it. Are they? Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. He rewards both the fool and the lawbreaker. Wait a minute. That is their only portion. That's the only thing they will ever get for the rest of their lives. That's their only portion. You know what that means? This life is the only one they'll have. At the resurrection, they will not get anything else. Why do you think the word says we're supposed to labor for the resurrection? Hmm. So it's not Satan that's blessing it? Well, it is, in a way. He's allowing it. He's blessing them by blinding them. No, Satan is blinding them. Yahweh is doing it for a reason. Just as he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Hello. It's to test us. Okay, now think about this. The word says the rich in this life, that's their only portion. Mm -hmm. Does it not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs says it over and over and over. The rich, this is all they'll get, they'll get forever. When they die, their remembrance is gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why would we desire to be like them? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't. Mm -hmm. All right, now watch. They will never have eternal life. As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Mm -hmm. How do you know an ignorant person? Well, you come in, you get baptized, you repent, you accept the name of Jesus as your Savior. And you go right back out in the world, get tattoos, piercings, whatever. Mm -hmm. You just return back to your own vomit. Mm -hmm. That's a fool. Hello? Your way should be changed. And watch. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. It doesn't say the fool is going to make it. It just says there's more hope for him. Did everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. So all these scholars, these preachers that are standing behind the multi-million dollar churches, pulpits, a fool has more hope than he does. Someone who's ignorant, there's more hope for him than there is for the man standing behind the pulpit. 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's extremely sad. The slothful man saith, There is a line in the way, a line in the streets. As a door turneth upon its hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Back and forth, back and forth, back mm -hmm. and forth, back and forth. A door opens up, opens up, opens up, opens up, opens up, opens up. Going the same way every time. Everybody following. The same thing with the slothful on his bed. He'll keep turning in the same direction, not going anywhere. Still in his bed. Still in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Hasn't progressed. Hasn't got a new bed. <laughs> <clears throat> the slothful hides hides his hand in his bosom. Most people have no idea what that means. That means to refuse to give to others. They'll stick it in their pocket before they'll help another. Now watch. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a season for a reason. Mm -hmm. Let me read that again, because I just screwed that one up. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. You know what a reason is? Excuse? An opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the scripture means this. Seven people might agree with me. The sluggard does what? He's wiser in his own conceit than seven men with their own opinion. Does it say he thinks he does? Or he thinks he's wiser? Watch this. A sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. In other words, a sluggard, someone who's lazy, they're always right, even though seven people testify against them. Seven people can come up with the opinion of the same scripture verse and show them proof in the scripture of what it says. Yet the sluggard, lazy man, in his own conceit, thinks he knows more about it than those seven men. It's true. Have you met anyone like that? I've met thousands. <laughs> it's true. You can have seven people line up side by side, show every one of the scripture verses where the guy's in the wrong, where the scripture does not preach against the lie or against the law. They won't believe it. He knows more about the word than you do, and he'll swear it till he's dead. Why? Because he fails to go back and search out the word and find out that it's true. Simple as that. He that passeth by and meddleth with strife belongeth not to him is like one that taketh the dog by the ears. As a mad man who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am not I in sport? Where no food or no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is a tail bearer or no tail bearer, bearer, the strife ceases. And I got to looking this up. What does a, a sluggard and a tail burr have in common? Come on. It's gossip. They both can say that. Gossip. Mm -hmm. Instead of the sluggard going out and checking out, verifying the facts, he just spreads what he's heard. What happens when the tail bearer is gone? The word says it. No more strife. When he's verified, done the work, done the labor, and checked it out, he'll have no reason to strive anymore. Do they follow? Any questions?